Hi, everybody. Um, I want to tell you some about my background. I have been a mental health therapist for 25 plus years. And I recently started studying the science of happiness. So we're going to talk about happiness and how do we bring that about. Uh, burnout is a hot topic. I read this article on Harvard Business Review, and it just came out February the 10th. And so I want to start with this for you to know this is being studied in the top business schools here in the States. And they found how do we prevent burnout? We need a sense of purpose with what we're doing, a manageable workload. And this is very interesting. Feeling that we can discuss our mental health at work and having an empathetic manager. So do you feel like this is your life uh, where things are in your way and some of it is inside your head? So self-doubt, worry, excuses. Uh, and things are just blocking you. And maybe not. Maybe you say, I'm just doing great. Something to think about today. Have you ever known someone who died all of a sudden? And here in the States, people say, well, they were eating really healthy and they were exercising. Why did they die? The research shows us that the self-care and resilience and what's going on on the inside affects our health just as much as smoking a pack of cigarettes a day, just as much as our diet and exercise. So this is a new concept that we're learning about in mental and physical health and researchers are finding how connected we are. There's a vagal nerve, and this nerve is activated with a stress response. So there's a difference between stress. Stress is actually normal. All of us have stress. And we may use the term stressed out. I'm stressed out. And learning how to manage stress is very important for us. And it's not a bad thing. And it's good to see stress as healthy, that this is just part of life. Uh, so when we have a stress response, that's very different. And this vagal nerve runs all the way down our body. So what that means is that stress response affects our whole body. It's not just in one area. And so think about where do you feel the stress? Is it tension here? Is it a headache? Do you tense up in other parts of your body? Uh, and it's important for us to increase our awareness. And that's why we're talking about this today. We want to stay in this green zone and identify what helps us to stay in this green zone. Breathing, meditation, prayer, uh, curiosity, openness. Uh, and we need to stay here, but the reality is that response kicks us up to the red zone. And we're going to respond one way or another. We're going to fight or we're gonna flight. So run away or run towards. If this really shocks us, then we're gonna freeze. And this is where we become depressed. We're not responding. We feel helpless. We feel hopeless. Uh, we feel trapped. And what's interesting here is shame. If you've ever felt ashamed, whether you talked about it or not, this is in the freeze zone. So what do we need to do? That's what we're here to talk about today. So we can go from that freeze, then we're going to go to the red zone and then to the green zone. So it progresses. I will make these slides and resources so you will be able to read everything in um, PDF format. So there's stress that we can control and stress that we can't control. So what is in our control? Checking email. So we can say, I'm going to focus on checking email. 
these three times throughout the day. The research is showing that when we pay attention to one task and become fully absorbed in it, it's really good for our brain health. So the multitasking is out. I am a huge multitasker. And so I'm having to learn this uh, to focus on one thing at a time, give the brain a break, and then focus on another task. Uh, so email is something we can control how we check it and when we respond. What can we not control? We cannot control the world events and what's happening around us. Um, and there are some um, interesting studies that learn helplessness. It causes depression. So if we're watching a lot of what's happening in, in the world and cannot do anything about it, then that's going to lead to loss of hope and depression. Because as human beings, we want to fix things. We want to problem solve. Okay, so what do we need for healthy brain functioning, a healthy body, a healthy mind? It's all intertwined. Well, nutrition. And I'm not here to tell you to eat beans, uh, but the studies have shown that cultures that eat beans and less meat live longer. Exercise, that really helps us um, to, with the brain functioning, to decrease those feelings that we have to regulate them. We need water. Our brain components are made mostly of water. Uh, sunshine, so it's getting out there, there's a seasonal affective disorder in the winter when it's dark and gloomy, it affects us. So uh, if there's a sunshine moment in the day, go outside and just soak it in. Um, 15 minutes is wonderful. And depression can be caused by low vitamin D levels. And so it's important if you're feeling depression to have that checked by the doctor because that can be easily fixed by taking supplements and getting more sunshine. So temperance, everything in moderation, self-restraint, uh, and so there's research, breakups are related to alcohol abuse. Uh, we don't make good decisions if we're abusing substances. Fresh air, uh, it's very important to get fresh air. In the epidemic in 1919, Eureka, California, there were so many people sick with the flu. Uh, the army built tents and the people who were in the tents healed faster than the people who were inside in the hospital. So unfortunately, the hospitals have had to seal the windows. I asked a nurse recently here locally, I'm in Tennessee in the USA, and she said, yep, we would tell people their diagnosis, their prognosis, and they would try to jump out the window. And that's why we had to seal the windows. Uh, we need rest. We need at least seven hours of sleep a night. Uh, and there's research in countries like the UK, Germany, and the US, 40% of our population isn't getting at least seven hours of sleep. Has this pandemic affected your sleep? There's exercises that we can do. There are routines. Self-care is very important. The research shows that the tech disrupts. So have a time when you say, I'm going to put this up. And I'm going to say no more tech. And it could be 15 minutes before you go to bed. Uh, in your bedroom, don't have your electronics because it will disrupt your sleep. TV is okay uh, if you want to feel that, that sound and rest. Uh, and working in our bed, having meetings in our bedroom, uh, it affects our psyche because our psyche needs to say, oh, this is the place that I rest and I unplug. Also, I heard a psychologist share uh, that the research is showing taking a shower at night. Uh, so we're warm from the shower and then our body is cooling down and it's signaling to our body it's time to sleep. We're going to focus on the final one today, trust. Uh, and the happiness studies and what they're showing. 
So when we are close to people that we feel safe with psychologically, that we know that they love us, that we can depend on them, uh, then this gives us higher life expectancy up to 14 years longer. Knowing our life has meaning gives us up to seven years longer. Dr. Martin Seligman at the University of Pennsylvania has a theory of well-being. Uh, we have emotions, emotions happen, express them, talk about them, regulate to positive. Okay, we're gonna talk about what a positive mindset does. Uh, being engaged, uh, being socially engaged, being engaged in our work, positive relationships. So the studies are showing that it's okay to argue. It's how we argue. It's, uh, it's can we solve the problem and communicate and move forward with that? That's normal. When you have people, we're going to have conflict. Um, and so people, even with a lot of chronic pain, elderly people reported high levels of happiness if they knew that they had someone to depend on them. The World Happiness Report that came out in March of 2020 showed one out of the 11 people in the world stated, I have no one to depend on. And that's an alarming statistic that is before the pandemic. So what has the shutdown caused for people? We need to feel that sense of meaning and accomplishment. Uh, so this is our theory of well-being from positive psychology. Okay, so one small positive thought in the morning can change your whole day. There's a study by Michelle Gillen and Sean Aker, three minutes of negative news in the morning. People reported 27% greater likelihood, an unhappy day, six to eight hours later as compared to the positive condition. Uh, so we need to be careful how much news we're watching and not to start our day with negative news because it could affect our day. All right. What does this, you know, really, I'm not going to pay attention to things because we don't realize what we're missing. Uh, and having our brain at a positive state, we're going to notice more things. So if you're thinking, whatever industry you are in, uh, we want to pay attention to detail. You know, happiness studies are showing the positive state increases our accuracy on tasks. Uh, and if you want to read more, Sean Aker in The Happiness Advantage, he studied people around the world, and this is in businesses, and he showed that doctors are going to make better diagnoses if their brain is positive. Salespeople are going to make a higher percentage of sales. So I want you to watch this video. Count how many times the people with the white shirt pass the ball. This is a test of selective attention. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the basketball. How many passes did you count? The correct answer is 15 passes. But did you see the... Okay, did you see the gorilla? Uh, that's the question. And uh, we're going to hear the commentary the next this slide. This is a test of selective attention. Count how many times the players were uh, in white. Here we go. Okay, here's the commentary. <laughs> One of my best known studies uh, was done with my collaborator, Chris Chabri, some years ago. And what we had was a video in which people were passing basketballs. So three people were wearing white shirts and they were passing a ball. And your task when you were watching the video was just to count how many times 
those three players pass the ball. We also had three players wearing black shirts passing their own ball, and you were supposed to ignore their passes. So as you're doing this task, after about 30 seconds, say, you have a person wearing a full body gorilla suit, walk into the middle of the scene, stop in the center, turn and face the camera, thump its chest, and then walk off the other side a total of about nine seconds later. And what we find is that about half the people who do this simply don't notice the gorilla. When Dan asked me to be a part of this experiment, I thought, no way, people are totally going to see me. I'm a 400-pound gorilla. And we rewind the tape and show it to them again, and their reaction is typically, I missed that? It's shocking that you could possibly miss something as obvious as a gorilla. Looking isn't the same as seeing. You have to focus attention on something in order to become aware of it. You know, I'm big, I'm a gorilla, and they don't see me. What's up with that? The key is that when you're focusing your attention on one aspect of your world, you don't have an unlimited amount of attention to devote to other things. And we only see those things that we focus our attention on. The problem is that on occasion, we filter something that we might want to notice, and we don't realize that we're doing that. That sort of mismatch between what we see and what we think we see is a really profound one that has all sorts of consequences for our daily lives. Okay, so did you see the gorilla? About half the people who watched that video in the studies do not see the gorilla. And it's really interesting because we don't realize what we don't see. Uh, the happiness studies, what is this all about that it's suddenly a science? Uh, when I earned my master's degree in counseling, it was in the early 90s, and we were not taught empirical research. Uh, and as I continued the continuing education, about 10 years ago, I started hearing that. This is empirically proven. Uh, and now we have technology with AI that we can scan people's brains and read emotions. And that's really powerful uh, because there are studies that say practice gratitude. Sean Aker, he asked his participants, write three things every day that you're grateful for, three different things every day. So just jot it down. He scanned the brain before with the fMRI, functional MRI. And then he scanned the participants' brains 23 days afterwards. And there were remarkable results. So our brain will go to positive when we're practicing gratitude. Right there, that is something to do to keep us in that green zone or to get us back in that green zone. So I'm in the red. I'm uh, very upset. And OK. You know, there's a reason that we're angry. There's a reason that we're afraid. And talk about it, journal about it, get it out, uh, and then practice some gratitude because that's going to help us go back to the green. And um, it definitely affects our blood pressure, our heart, uh, and it stresses our whole system. Happiness studies. Okay, Harvard has an ongoing 80-year study on the well-being and happiness of people. Robert Waldinger is currently the head of it. He's a Zen master. It's interesting to hear him talk about it. And they started at Harvard because in 1930, this is who you studied were the men who went to Harvard. There were no women. And then they went to a lower socioeconomic area in Boston. And they got a group of men and they followed their lives all these years. Uh, so it's not just questionnaires that they're asking them. They're also doing physicals and blood tests and they're interviewing their wives, their families. Uh, and they were shocked. They were shocked to find out that happiness, the key to happiness is connection and our relationships. Uh, so if we look at the, First slide I showed you, social connection keeps us in that green zone. That's medically, scientifically proven. It's not money. Like we need a certain amount of money to live and be comfortable. And of course that affects our happiness. Uh, but they're showing the research up to a certain amount because we want to live comfortably. And after that, we could have 
a lot more money and it wouldn't increase our happiness. What does sustain our happiness and cause it is connection. Okay, so we're not ignoring the problems. We're looking at the problems, we're solving the problems, we're being very rational and we're looking at the upside. Uh, optimism, we are not naturally optimistic. Uh, uh, most of us aren't. And so it's a skill, it's a muscle that we can build. And we don't even realize how negative our thinking is. And so think about having a buddy with you uh, to catch you when you say things that are negative or pessimistic. So for example, I'm driving and I have a flat tire or I'm playing sports and I'm not performing really well. We're not gonna let that ruin the game or ruin the day. So I get the flat tire fixed. What's my thinking? So pay attention. What's your thinking during that time? Am I thinking now my day's ruined? I can't believe this happened. Bad things always happen to me. Catch those thoughts. And we can say, nope, that's not the truth. Uh, you know, I'm getting this tire fixed. Um, or if you're playing um, football, I'm going to take a break and go back to the football game. And I am using that word. We call it soccer here in the U.S. And it, take that mental break and you will not ruin my day. And again, kick the brain to positive with some thoughts of gratitude. It literally will light up your brain and reset. Uh, so recharging, think about your phone. Every day I have to plug this phone in and it gets a charge. Uh, also, Apple sends me updates. So I need to update the software. Uh, so every day we need to charge ourselves with self-care, making sure that we get the nutrients and exercise and sunlight and focus on our thinking and feel comfortable with expressing emotions. And I know that's very new um, in our culture. We're not used to doing that, especially at work. And so, we're, But we heard from the Harvard Business Review. Also, I took some classes with Wharton Executive Education, and there are studies, Love at Work. This is a study by Sagal Barsad, where across industries, they have studied when employees feel a sense of belonging at work, when employees feel cared for, and love is practiced towards one another, then they will take care of their customers, their clients, and their patients naturally. Okay, so Dr. Stuart Friedman, he's out of Wharton. He studied people's lives and we hear work-life balance. Uh, it's, and it's not so much of a balance, especially now with the pandemic, we are in a time many people are still working from home. How do you integrate work and life? Uh, so when things are tense at work, flex the family and the personal life. When things are tense at home, flex work. Are we able to do that? So he just talks a little bit about this. I mean, come on, you've got to sacrifice everything in your life, right? And what I knew from my own experience, but also as a consultant, as a coach, as, a, as an educator, and as a researcher, was that that's actually not true, even though that is the common wisdom. And certainly, I'm not saying here that you know you can you can have everything all the time, and that right. uh, uh, you know you you can have success without without sacrifice, without effort, without you know discipline and mm -hmm. persistence in the face of in the face of disappointment. But what I am saying is that not only is it possible to create a greater sense of harmony among the different parts of your life while achieving greatness. It's actually necessary that the people who are most successful, even by you know external markers of mm -hmm. fame and wealth, uh, and you know power, uh, those are the folks who are able to figure out in their own way how to bring together the different parts of their lives over the course of their lives, mm -hmm. and indeed, it's their commitments to family, to community, and to their private selves, their minds, bodies, spirits. That's what gives them the strength, the resources, uh, the support that they need 
to be successful in the professional world. So, so reason one was to address yeah. this issue of, you know, uh, you have to sacrifice everything. Right. Not true. And you're saying it's, it's a false choice, basically. It's a false choice that it holds us back from the kinds of success, the kinds of happiness that you're talking about. Indeed, uh, that to think in terms of, you know, the binary work life balance, right. which is a, a term that I have been railing against for decades. Yeah. And, I, and I think I think we're making some progress there because more people are talking instead about work and life integration or harmony mm -hmm. uh, over the course of life. And that. OK, so there we have an established professor talking about the integration. So what is our takeaway today? You may be saying, I'm young and I'm strong and I'm pretty resilient. And I get that. I remember 30 years ago, I'm going to be 51 on Sunday. So wish me a happy birthday. Uh, and boy, you know, life happens. Uh, disappointments happen. And uh it, it doesn't just happen to older people. It happens too when we're younger. But I remember when I was younger, uh, it's more challenging now in a lot of ways, not just physically, but also uh, with the stress response. Uh, but it is important. It will have an effect, uh, what we're doing with our emotions and our self-care. It will catch up with us. Uh, so in some cultures, like in Japan, People who work too hard, they have heart attacks. There was nothing wrong with them. It was the stress response, and they weren't taking care of themselves. Okay, so a positive outlook makes our brains perform better. Achieving a positive mindset is fostered by happiness, and this comes about with strong connections. This is our scientifically backed takeaway for today. So I would love to take questions and meet with you in a breakout room. Um, I do have some complimentary material on my website. Uh, I have a newsletter that has about a year of archived life coaching articles and materials there that um, you can find and um, read.